holders of that debt don't get their money back. Boom, the claims get diminished. In this instance, if the future isn't large enough to pay back the claims, then defaults are simply a way of not paying them back. The inflation route can be confusing, so think of it this way. What if you sold your house to someone and elected to hold a note for $500,000? The terms call for the note to be repaid all at once in 10 years as a single payment of $650,000. Well, what if you get paid your $650,000 right on time? But that $650,000 will only buy this house. You got paid all right, but your claim on the future was vastly diminished by inflation. In the default scenario, your money is still worth something, but you don't get it back. In the inflation scenario, you get it back, but it hardly buys anything. In both cases, your future was diminished, so the impact is very nearly the same, but the means of achieving it are wildly different. So the questions you need to ponder for yourself are, have too many claims been made on the future? And if so, will we face inflation or defaults as the means of squaring things up? You will arrive at wildly different life decisions depending on whether you answer yes or no to the first question and inflation or defaults to the second question. So they are worth pondering. All right, here's what we learned. Key concept number six. Debt is a claim on future human labor. Second, per capita debt has never been higher. We are in truly unprecedented territory in this country. Debt has increased by $16 trillion in the past five years, and most of it consumptive debt. This means that future consumption will have to be seriously curtailed or will enter a period of debt destruction, either by default or inflation. And finally, key concept number seven, our debt markets assume that the future will be much larger than the present. Our entire economic system, and by extension our way of life, is founded on debt. And debt is founded on the assumption that the future will always be bigger than the past. Therefore, it is utterly vital that we examine this assumption closely because if this assumption is false, so are a lot of other things we may be taking for granted. Whew. All right, we are done. I'll see you next time. But when we get to the federal government, that's when the scary numbers emerge. David Walker, the recently retired comptroller of the U.S. and a personal hero of mine, said of the U.S. government, its financial position is worse than advertised. It has a broken business model. It faces deficits in its budget, its balance of payments, its savings, and its leadership. Wow, those are some pretty strong words. In my assessment, he's absolutely right. And here's some data to support that. This is a table taken right from the U.S. government annual report found on the Treasury Department website. Again, we are going to be looking at NPV numbers. The first is a nearly $9 trillion shortfall representing the total U.S. government net position without including Social Security and Medicare. Again, this means that all U.S. government cash inflows, plus the value of all government assets, would have to be offset against known outlays to determine that, today, the U.S. government would have to somehow obtain $8.9 trillion to balance its liabilities against its assets. But that's not even the one-fifth of it. Once we add in Social Security and Medicare, the shortfall suddenly balloons to $53 trillion by the Treasury Department's own calculations. Oh, whoa, stop right there. That's more than four times GDP. This means that the U.S. government is insolvent. Why is this not topic number one on the presidential campaign trail?
a country this far in hock has some real future issues and is potentially on its way to bankruptcy. In case you are harboring the notion that there's some money socked away in a special U.S. government account, like a lockbox, this picture shows George Bush standing next to the entire Social Security Trust Fund. Yep, there it is. The entire trust fund is a three-ring binder with slips of paper in it saying that the U.S. government has spent all the money and replaced it with special treasury bonds. Hold on there. Aren't treasury bonds an obligation of the U.S. government? How can the government owe itself money? It can't. All government revenue either comes from taxpayers or borrowing. So when the time comes to pay off those special bonds, that money will either come from taxpayers or additional borrowing. If it were possible to owe money to yourself and pay interest to boot, then we could all become fabulously wealthy by writing ourselves checks. But, of course, this is a foolish, easily dispelled notion. At any rate, Depending on which government agency's numbers you use, the federal shortfall is anywhere from $53 trillion to $85 trillion. This number is so large that it even scares small monkeys. And proving the point that you cannot grow your way out of an NPV shortfall, this number has grown by nearly $40 trillion over the past 10 years advancing during both strong and weak economic times. And finally, saving is related to investing. And according to the American Society of Civil Engineers, we've fallen short there as well. In 2005, they assessed the condition of 12 categories of infrastructure, including bridges, roadways, drinking water systems, and wastewater treatment plants. They gave the U.S. an overall grade of D and calculated that $1.6 trillion would be needed over the next five years to bring us back up to first world standards. Since that was in 2005, and inflation for things made out of metal and asphalt has advanced enormously since then, let's just round that up to, say, an even $2 trillion. Putting it all together, we find that a personal failure to save is reflected by a state and local failure to save, which are themselves mirrored by a corporate failure to save, all dwarfed by a failure to save at the federal government level. And capping it all off is a profound failure to invest. All of these deficits lie before us and lead me to conclude that the next 20 years are going to be completely unlike the last 20 years. This is our legacy, the economic and physical world that we are choosing to leave to those who follow us. How did we get here? How did this happen? Next, we move on to assets to see how they stack up against our debts and our national failure to save. The same dynamic is true for other assets as well. Sufficient buyers are essential, or the wealth is as good as stranded. I mentioned that there are also two big oversights in the Household Wealth Report, and the first is that the Fed mysteriously does not include the general liabilities of the government when calculating household net wealth. Wouldn't it make sense for the Fed to offset fees against household wealth? After all, who else besides the taxpayers living in households are going to pay off those liabilities? Nobody. That's who. If the Fed did perform this offset, household net worth would plunge below zero. So I can guess why this comparison is never made. The second oversight is that the data is presented as if it applied to our entire country in a fairly even and useful manner. It does not. The top 1% owns 35% of all net household wealth and, looking at stocks only, owns 56% of all stock by value. 
If you can't see it, I apologize. The top 1% is represented by a very thin red smear at the top of that column there. It's great that our stock market keeps powering higher, but for every trillion dollars it goes up, 560 billion of that goes to only one out of 100 households. The top 20%, which includes the top 1%, owns 85% of all household net wealth and 80% of all stocks by value. This means that the bottom 80% of the citizens of this country, represented in yellow, holds only 15% of the total wealth of this country. Remember, an imbalance between rich and poor is the oldest and most fatal ailment of all republics. More immediately, this tells us that our credit crisis is going to be worse than advertised. Just as was true of the wealth gap in the late 1920s, before the onset of the Great Depression, the severity of the crisis will not depend on average wealth, but on the distribution of the wealth. If a large swath of the population lacks the means to weather the storm, then that storm will be longer and harsher than otherwise would be the case. So what does it mean that 80% of our population possesses a meager 15% of the total wealth? For one thing, it means that recent efforts by the Fed to provide massive amounts of liquidity to support the biggest and wealthiest banks at the inflationary expense of the lower classes were not only misguided, but they were cruel and unusual. This leads to an easy prediction to make. The wealth gap in the United States will hamper our recovery and deepen the downturn. In order to really understand why I have been harping on this notion of assets being variable and their value being dependent on the ratio of buyers to sellers, we'll need to take a quick trip into demographics. Recall that the U.S. government has not saved in any of its entitlement programs and that it has a massive shortfall in them, measuring the tens of trillions of dollars. That situation comes about because the entitlement programs are really wealth transfer programs, not savings accounts. And so they depend on a significant surplus of current workers to retirees. The shortfalls in these programs are being exacerbated by a troubling trend. In 1950, there were seven workers per retiree, and the system was balanced. By 2005, that ratio had dropped to only five to one, and the system was already exhibiting signs of distress. By 2030, that ratio will have plummeted to a thoroughly unworkable value of less than three to one. And this trend comes about as a feature of the so-called baby boom. This is a demographic chart of the United States, and each bar represents a clustering of all the people who are within a five-year wide age window, as seen on the left axis. The baby boomers number around 75 million strong and roughly occupy these four bands. While it may not seem like much, the hole that exists in the population behind the baby boomers represents an enormous challenge and even threat to our entitlement programs and will greatly complicate our efforts to resolve our levels of debt and our national failure to save. A more normal population distribution, if you will, and the kind that humans evolved with over countless millennia looks like this, a pyramid. Again, this shows five-year wide age brackets with men in red and women in yellow. This distribution is capable of supporting an entitlement program, such as the one in the U.S., that is based on transferring wealth directly from workers to retirees. But when we cast this chart forward to 2000, the baby boomer bulge is quite apparent. Besides the challenge that this demographic profile offers to the entitlement programs, an even larger challenge is presented to both the debt and savings issues I painted in previous chapters, and even to the value of our assets. Here's what I mean. 
The boomers are the wealthiest generation ever. They hold nearly all of the assets, and they will need to dispose of those assets to fund their retirements. Who exactly are the boomers planning on selling their assets to? This guy? Even if this generation somehow could afford to buy all these assets, there simply aren't enough people in this generation to buy them. In order to fund their retirement dreams, boomers are going to have to sell off their assets. And again, we might wonder, to whom exactly? And lastly, if the massive accumulation of debt over the past 23 years was predicated on the assumption that the future will be much larger than the present, we might also question how exactly that will come to pass if boomers are retiring en masse and there are fewer behind them to take their place. Man, the next generation better be prepared to work really, really hard. Too bad they're graduating with the highest levels of college debt ever recorded. This sort of demographic profile will be with us for decades and cannot be wished away or fixed by some clever policy. It is simply a fact of life and one that we do well to recognize and plan for rather than ignore. Boomer retirement has already begun and the pace of this will accelerate rapidly over the next 15 years which will make the 20 teens quite interesting and leads me to conclude that the next 20 years are going to be completely unlike the last 20 years. Next time, we're going to discuss asset bubbles. Understanding the destructive dynamics of bubbles is critical if you want to know what's coming next and why the Federal Reserve is panicking right now. Remember, a bubble exists when asset price inflation rises beyond what incomes can sustain. And that's exactly what we see in this chart. So where was the Fed during all of this? Well, they were busy writing research papers convincing themselves that there was no housing bubble, as seen in this 2004 Fed study entitled are home prices the next bubble? The main summary of the study started off on a good note, stating, Home prices have been rising strongly since the mid-1990s, prompting concerns that a bubble exists in this asset class and that home prices are vulnerable to a collapse that could harm the U.S. economy. But then the main conclusion of the paper, veered sharply off into a ditch, reading, A close analysis of the U.S. housing market in recent years, however, finds little basis for such concerns. The marked upturn in home prices is largely attributable to strong market fundamentals. Home prices have essentially moved in line with increases in family income and declines in nominal mortgage interest rates essentially moved in line with increases in family income. What? One of the most widely known facts of our time is that family incomes did not move up at all on an inflation-adjusted basis during the housing boom and is one of the principal economic failures of the first decade of the millennium. This just goes to show that the Federal Reserve is either stocked with inept or biased researchers, and of the two, I'm not sure which makes me feel worse about our chances of safely navigating through this mess. But the Fed's researchers were simply doing what millions of people did, namely falling prey to believing that somehow, this time it's different. But that's just how bubbles are. People take leave of their senses use all manner of rationales to justify their positions, but then, suddenly, one day the illusion lifts and what seemed to be unassailably true no longer makes any sense at all. Once that day happens, the fate of the bubble is reduced to measuring the speed of its collapse. While it's tempting to lay the blame for what's happening on the housing bubble, it's important to remember 
that the dramatic rise in house prices was itself just a symptom of a credit bubble run amok. Total credit at the end of 2000, when the stock bubble was bursting, stood at $27 trillion. By the end of 2007, it stood at an astounding $48 trillion. This $21 trillion increase in borrowing is five times larger than the increase in U.S. GDP over the same period of time. Any attempt to understand the housing bubble has to be viewed against the backdrop of this massive increase in debt. But as we noted in an earlier chapter, this credit bubble has been going on for 25 years. Unwinding a multi-generational debt binge is going to require some enormous changes in attitudes and habits. One reason that any bubble, but especially a housing bubble like this one, is so destructive is because so many bad investments are made along the way. Too many houses were built, too many shopping centers, and too many condos, and nearly all of them too large and ill-positioned for a future of expensive energy. Sorry to say, but all those trillions of dollars were wasted, and worse, stole opportunities from the things that needed money more. The Austrian School of Economics has a very crisp and historically accurate definition of how a credit bubble ends. According to Ludwig von Mises, there is no means of avoiding the final collapse of a boom brought about by credit expansion. The alternative is only whether the crisis should come sooner as a result of a voluntary abandonment of further credit expansion or later as a final and total catastrophe of the currency system involved. This is a view I happen to ascribe to and explains my strong preference for placing my wealth out of the path of a potential dollar collapse. As a nation, we've undertaken desperate measures to avoid abandoning the continuation of our credit expansion, leaving a final catastrophe of the currency as our most likely outcome. As for the timing, it could hardly be worse. Dealing with a bursting housing bubble is hardly the sort of challenge we need at this particular moment in history, but here we are. The stewardship and vision displayed by the Federal Reserve in Washington, D.C. in bringing all of this about has been utterly atrocious. So, what can we expect from a collapse in credit bubble? Simply put, Everything that fed upon and grew as a consequence of too much easy credit will collapse. I am especially leery of financial stocks, low-grade bonds, and, of course, real estate. I see very few conventional ways to protect one's wealth, and so I invite you to begin asking yourself, and if you have one, your financial advisor, some very hard questions about the safety of your holdings. You'll be glad you did. Remember, this time it's probably not different. Please join us for the next chapter, where we will explore the extent to which we have been telling ourselves pleasant half-truths and other falsehoods, which I call fuzzy numbers. Thank you for listening. Congratulations, you have made it to the final chapter of data. The remaining two chapters are summaries and conclusions. Let me start right out by saying that this is not going to be about global warming. Instead, I want to focus on more linear, less complicated, and I believe more immediate concerns. The primary intent of the crash course is to show you that there's a bit of a disconnect between an exponential money system that enforces a creed of constant growth and living on a spherical planet. In this section, a lot of you are going to find out that the planet is a whole lot smaller than you might have thought. Most of the reason is contained in this curve right here, population. Consider that the entire human population finally reached 3 billion people in 1960, 
and that projections call for adding another 3 billion people in only 42 more years. Before we contemplate 50% more humans in only 40 years, let me show you the pickle in which the current crop already finds itself. This year, there will be 70 million more humans on the surface of the planet than last year. 70 million. To put that in context, that is nearly three times as many people as live in the top 10 most populous U.S. cities combined. Worldwide population growth is equivalent to three of each of these cities each year for the next 40 years. More people means more demand for resources, more aluminum, more food, more consumer goods shipped to more places, and more cars. Always more cars. And in case anybody has the misperception that maybe this isn't such a big deal because maybe these people will be living in China in a dirt hovel with maybe a donkey in a wicker basket. Let me show you one of the fastest growing cities in the world. In many respects, it is newer and more modern than most Western cities. This is what everybody aspires to. And people are the same the world over. We all want to live in bright, shiny cities, and we want to shop for nice things in nice districts. As a quick aside, China is said to have between 1.3 and 1.6 billion citizens. This means that the entire U.S. population of 300 million people, or 0.3 billion, would be referred to by the Chinese as a rounding error. In fact, if we combine the top five most populous cities in the U.S., we'd find that they would have fewer inhabitants than the largest city in China. But I want to return to the earlier statement that over the next 40 years, another 3 billion people will crowd onto the surface of the planet. One trait that humans share with all organisms is that we use the easiest to obtain and the highest quality resources first. When we use the Earth's resources, we start with the richest, deepest soils, with the largest trees, and the richest fishing waters. That is, we naturally exploit the highest quality resources first. At this point, I want to recall that oil is a finite natural resource, and because of this, we find that individual oil fields and collections of oil exhibit a classic extraction profile that resembles a bell curve. We can broaden this concept to create a generalized resource extraction profile where we start with the closest, richest, and most accessible and highest grade resources first before moving on to successively harder and poorer and thinner or more distant resources. What this means is that over time, the energy required to obtain those resources goes up, as do the costs. About this, there really can be no doubt. Here's an example. When we first came to this country, we were finding some pretty spectacular things just lying around, like this copper nugget. Soon, these were all gone, and we were onto smaller nuggets, and then onto copper ores that had some of the highest concentrations. Now, now we have things like the Bingham Canyon Mine in Utah. It is two and a half miles across and three-fourths of a mile deep, and it started out as a mountain. It sports a final ore concentration of just 0.2%. Do you think we'd have gone to all this effort if there were still massive copper nuggets lying around in a stream bed? Mm -mm, no way. Let's take a closer look. You see that truck way down there? It's fueled by petroleum, diesel specifically. If we couldn't spare the diesel to run that truck, what do you suppose we'd carry the ore out with? Donkeys? These trucks carry 255 tons per load. Supposing a donkey could carry 150 pounds, this means this truck carries the same in a single load as 3,400 donkeys. That's quite a lot of donkeys. My point here is that a hole in the ground a couple of miles across and three-fourths of a mile deep is a pretty spectacular display of the use of energy. When energy begins to get scarce, it seems unlikely to me that we'll be digging too many more holes like it, which means copper will become scarce. 
Now, here's where the concept gets interesting. The amount of energy and money that is required to extract any mineral or metal is a function of the ore grade. We would measure that as the percent of the ore that consists of the desired substance. So a 10% copper ore, for example, would contain 10% copper and 90% um, other stuff, like, I don't know, rocks or something. If we plot out how much other stuff we have to extract and then dispose of in pursuit of our desired substance, we get a chart that looks like this. Does this look familiar to you? It should. It's an exponential chart. It tells us that if we had an ore body with only 0.2% copper in it, we'd need to mine 500 pounds of ore in order to extract one pound of copper. I used this particular value because that happens to be the concentration of the Bingham Canyon mine. This helps to explain why this hole is so big. It tells us that without these giant trucks, we probably wouldn't be mining such low ore grades. It means that we are already on the far right edge of this bell curve in terms of energy and cost. Do we do this because we like the challenge of low ore grades? No, we do it because we've already high graded all the other known ore bodies, and this is what we're down to. We do it because it's the best option left. We do it because in only 200 years, we've already burned through all of the better grades. Let's look at another example, coal. Coal production, as measured by tons mined, has been steadily growing at 2% a year since the 1940s. This sort of stable, continuous exponential growth is exactly what our economy and society demand. President Bush recently said that we have 250 years of coal left, implying that this red arrow can continue in this direction for another 250 years. In other words, there is no urgency here, just a whole lot of coal waiting for us to come and get it. But there's a wrinkle in this story. Coal comes in several different grades. The most desirable is shiny, hard, black anthracite coal. It yields the most heat when burned and has a low moisture content and is highly valued in the steelmaking industry. Then comes bituminous coal, offering slightly less energy per pound of weight and then sub-bituminous, and then finally something called lignite, which is really, really low energy, high moisture stuff called brown coal that is pretty much only useful for burning. The next grade below lignite is uh, rocks, which burn only slightly less vigorously than lignite. Let's look at the U.S. history with mining anthracite. Notice a trend here? The reason we're not mining more of the stuff is because it's pretty much all gone. Our entire bequeathment of anthracite, formed over hundreds of millions of years, was largely used over a span of about a hundred years. So we moved on to the next best stuff, bituminous coal. And here we might note that a peak in production was actually hit in 1990. Was this because we lost interest in this better grade of coal? No, it simply means that we started to run out of it. Naturally, we then moved on to the next grade, subbituminous coal, which we can see here making up the difference. And even lignite is getting into the game, although I don't expect to see this line really begin to move up until the subbituminous coal production has peaked out. Now we get to the really interesting part. Remember I said that the heat content or available free energy of coal got progressively worse with each grade? If we plot the total energy content of the coal mine instead of the tonnage, we get a very different picture. Where the tonnage has been moving up in a nice, steady, neat 2% climb, we note that the total energy has leveled off and has climbed by exactly 0% over the last nine years. Ah, so we're using more energy and spending more money to mine more and more coal, but we're receiving less and less back from those efforts? Let's bring back this image again. Where do you think we are on this curve with respect to coal? Are the best years still in front of us? Do you feel secure with the 250 years of coal that the president has said we have left?
The net energy of coal varies quite widely, but in extracting lignite, we are already pretty far down this net energy curve. Well, that's okay. We can switch to uranium, right? It turns out there's a little wrinkle in this story, too. When we look at the ore grades that exist for uranium, we see that they range from a high of over 20% to as low as 0.007%. Of all the ore grades proven and inferred to exist, 30% of them are greater than 0.1% in purity, leaving 70% below the grade of 0.1%. Only one country, Canada, has proven reserves at a higher grade than 1% while 11 countries have already entirely exhausted their uranium ores. When we consider ore grades in such extremely low concentrations, the mining yields are quite dramatic, but not in a good way. Here's where 70% of the known uranium reserves lie, requiring that anywhere from 500 pounds to 10,000 pounds of ore body be removed and processed to obtain a single pound of the mineral, uranium oxide. Clearly, as with copper, we are slipping down a slope of declining ore concentrations for uranium, and it cannot be disputed that greater energy and cost is demanded at this end of the curve. Just in the sake of interest, France gets 90% of its electricity from nuclear power, but their uranium extraction peaked in the late 1980s, while the U.S. passed its mining peak in the early 1980s. Both countries are well past peak uranium. If uranium is the energy of the future, the future lies somewhere outside of these two countries. In fact, this same general theme naturally applies to anything we humans set our attention to. Phosphorus, uh, essential mineral for farming, uh, fish in the oceans, and every single source of metal are all telling the same story. We are running out of high-grade materials. For most things, there is either already a shortage or one will soon arise within the next few decades. And even these assessments assume that sufficient energy exists allowing us to dig as many mild deep pits as we wish in our quest for the last low-grade ores. The story here is that we as a species all over the globe have already mined the richest ores, found the easiest energy sources, and farmed the richest soils. It is said that for every bushel of wheat taken to market, a bushel of topsoil is lost. In that sense, given that it takes hundreds of years to form a single inch of topsoil, it can be said that our farmers are actually mining the soil. We have taken several hundreds of millions of years of natural ore body and energy deposition, and thousands of years of soil creation, and largely burned through them in the few years since oil was discovered. It is safe to say that in human terms, once these are gone, man, they're gone. What I am offering is a comprehensive view of how all our problems are actually interrelated and need to be viewed as such, or solutions will continue to elude us. So let's review the key trends which appear to be converging on a very narrow window of the future. We began with an understanding of money and the fact that our money is loaned into existence with interest, and that this results in powerful pressures to keep the amount of credit, or money, constantly growing by some percentage every year. This is the very definition of exponential growth, which we can easily see in our money, and of course, inflation charts. Keeping this dynamic in mind, we encountered the data on debt which is really a claim on the future, vastly exceeding all historical benchmarks. The flip side to this, but a significant sociological trend in its own right, is the steady erosion of savings observed over the exact same period of time. Combined, we have the highest levels of debt ever recorded, coincident with some of the lowest levels of savings ever recorded. And we saw that our failure to save extends through all levels of our society and even includes a desperate failure to invest in our infrastructure. Next, we saw how assets, primarily housing, have been in a sustained bubble, and that is now bursting. 
and will take many years to play out. When credit bubbles burst, they result in financial panics that end up destroying a lot of capital. Actually, that's not quite right. This quote says it better. Panics do not destroy capital. They merely reveal the extent to which it has been previously destroyed by its betrayal into hopelessly unproductive works. So we learned that a bursting bubble is not something that's easily fixed by authorities because their attempts to limit further damage are misplaced. The damage has already been done. It is contained within too many houses and too many strip malls sold for too high prices and too many goods imported and bought on credit. All of that is done. All that's left is figuring out who ends up holding the bag, and right now, these guys are working hard to assure that that's you, the taxpayer. Then we learn that the most profound U.S. government financial shortfalls rest with a demographic problem that itself cannot be fixed by any act of law or any level of optimism. It is simply a fact, an inconvenient fact of circumstance, much like gravity sometimes, but a fact nonetheless. Even more than this, we learn that the assets boomers use to describe their wealth, stocks and bonds and real estate, all have to be sold to somebody at some point in order to extract their value. And we raise the uncomfortable observation that there simply are fewer people behind the boomers to whom these assets can be sold. When sellers exceed buyers, values fall. Through all of this, the economic numbers that we reported to ourselves were systematically debased until they no longer reflected reality. If false data leads to bad decisions, then it's no wonder that we find ourselves in our current predicament. Only by returning to an honest self-appraisal can we plot a strategic and meaningful course to the future. Then we learn that energy is the source of all economic activity and that oil is by far the most important source of energy. Our entire economic configuration is built around the assumption of unlimited growth in energy supplies, but this is an easily refuted proposition. Individual oil fields peak and so do collections of them. And so peak oil is not so much a theory as it is an observation about how oil fields age. We then explored the tension that obviously exists between a monetary system that enforces exponential growth and the fact that our primary energy source has either already peaked or will soon. Somehow, the U.S. has not even begun to invest in the future without cheap oil. We have no plan B. Lastly, we noted that the environment, meaning the world's resources and natural systems upon which we depend, is exhibiting clear signs that our exponential population is driving exponential exploitation of resources, hastening their final depletion and altering ecosystems at an alarming rate. Also, we learned that even minor changes to the systems we depend on, such as shifting rainfall patterns, can create massive, usually unplanned costs that will take priority over other needs. And yes, we've faced problems before and we'll face these as well. The concern comes when we view them all at once. Placed on a timeline, we see that a bursting housing bubble is already happening just as the first wave of boomers enters retirement. At the same time, Peak oil demand will outstrip supply, forcing an enormously expensive adjustment, even as unknowable costs associated with resource depletion and a shifting climate lurk in the not-too-distant future. And sitting over all of this, limiting our options, will be our national failure to save and invest and historically unprecedented levels of debt. This timeline stretching from now to 2020 reveals a truly massive set of challenges converging on an exceptionally short window of time. The question becomes, 
where will the money come from to apply to each of these challenges if our savings are depleted and our debt levels are already in uncharted territory? Any one of these events will prove to be a difficult strain on our national economy, while any two could be disruptive. If three or more happen simultaneously, it's not hard to foresee the economic destruction of our country as a result, or perhaps the dollar utterly ruined as a store of wealth. How many trillions will be required to fund boomer retirement? How many trillions to reshape our transportation infrastructure to accommodate peak oil? Where will the tens of trillions come from to make up shortfalls in pensions and entitlement programs? How do we make good on these pension and entitlement promises while burdened with the highest debt loads ever seen? Where does the money come from to clean up the aftermath of a bursting housing bubble? How much more expensive will food and minerals be in the future when oil is peak but many more people are placing higher demands on increasingly marginal resources? Each of these key trends or threats will take years, if not decades, to address, and yet we find them all parked almost directly in front of us without any serious national discussions or planning. With every passing day, we squander precious time while the problems grow larger and more costly, if not thoroughly intractable. Buying time is not a strategy and will prove to be a disastrous tactic. The mark of a mature adult is someone who can manage complexity and plans ahead. My opinion is that with few exceptions, the current political and corporate leadership of this country are doing neither. We need to change this. It is long past time to give up the adolescent notion that we can have our cake, eat it too, and borrow more when it's gone. It is time, quite simply, to return to living within our natural and economic budgets. We need to set priorities, set a budget, and stick to both. And you? If you haven't already, you need to begin to embrace the possibility that the path to the future might not be straight. It may take a few twists and turns and end up somewhere entirely unexpected. And that you happen to be alive at one of the most interesting points in human history, a time when a great shift may occur. This can be frightening or it can be exhilarating, and that choice is yours. So what do we do about all this? What can you do, and what steps should you be considering right now? Please join me for the final chapter of the crash course. Thank you for listening. And likelihood, which is the same as the probability of the event. To get a handle on time, consider grouping events on a timeline. In the first horizon, which I see as running from zero to two years out, I place the housing bust, a credit bubble burst, and the possibility of a systemic banking failure. A bit further out, I foresee petroleum demand and supply crossing, issues with boomer retirement, and the possible emergence of very high inflation. Even further out, I see really big hairy challenges like national insolvency, perhaps the end of debt-based money, and the emergence of a new socio or economic model. Since I can't respond to all of these at once, I mainly focus on those that are within the immediate horizon. Again, you'll probably place very different things in each of these horizons, and those would be the ones you would use. These happen to be mine. For illustrative purposes, we'll run through an example based on the possibility of a systemic banking failure. Next. I segment things by impact and likelihood. If you understand insurance, you already understand this next process. Think of fire insurance on a house. We don't carry it because such an event is especially likely, because it isn't, but because the impact is so catastrophic. That is, a prudent person will combine impact and likelihood to come to the decision that purchasing fire insurance makes sense. So here's a way to do that in the other areas in your life. 
Suppose we construct a simple 2x2 two two chart, and on this axis we break the likelihood of the event into high and low buckets, while on the other axis we split the impact into high and low buckets. Something that is both low impact and low likelihood is something that we should not ever spend any of our precious time or resources on. Things that fall here are just not worth worrying about. Anything that is high impact and high likelihood is a slam dunk. We always attend to these, and we do them first. Things that are of high impact but low likelihood require more thought, but generally we would usually attend to most of the things in this box next. After that, we'd sometimes attend to the things that are low impact but high likelihood, especially if they happen to have easy or quick remedies. So this becomes the area where events fall that I attend to. How you happen to fill this in will depend on your age, financial means, family situation, and a host of other factors. Now, because I consider there to be a 50% chance of a systemic financial collapse at some point over the next two years, I place this as a high impact, high probability event, meaning that this is a risk that deserved and got my very highest attention. So let's continue with the example. With this 2x2 two two grid in our minds, we might flesh out the risks associated with financial system collapse using a table that looks like this. First, we might assess the likelihood of widespread bank closures to be high, the impact to be high, and therefore the rank of this event is high. Then we might come to the same conclusions about our own personal banks but we might assess the overall rank of a disruption in the food distribution network as medium, and dollar destruction as medium because it has both a high and a low component, which average out to medium for us. We might assess cuts to government spending as low. These are just a few examples. Other things can and should be added to this list. The point here is to assess the likelihood and impact of each event that we think applies to the scenario we are studying. When you've completed this, you'll have a ranked list of events. My recommendation is that when you do these exercises, that you do them with like-minded friends. They will think of things that you're going to miss, it's more fun, and it will all go a lot faster. Now you've got to generate a list. You do this by filtering those events that are imminent, likely, and of high impact through your self-assessment. I guarantee when you do this, you will end up with an entirely too long list of things that you could possibly do. It's time to prioritize. First, the list can quickly be broken into things that you can or will do and things that you can't or won't do. Of the things that you can or will do, we will break those into three tiers of action, such that Tier 1 is always started and completed before beginning Tier 2, which will always precede Tier 3. This makes it much easier to get started because the lists are much more manageable. Of the things that you can't or won't do, your options include finding somebody else who can do them, and this is where community comes in, or letting them go and not worrying about them anymore. Now, back to our example. Let's suppose that after filtering your ranked events through your self-assessment, you came up with a nice long list of actions that you'd like to undertake. Almost certainly there are too many to do all at once, and it's time to use the three-tier system to identify and tackle the easiest, lowest cost, highest bang for the buck stuff first. So what is Tier 1? It consists of the easiest, quickest, and cheapest items that require minimal outside assistance and no substantive changes to lifestyle. In this example, then, we might decide that taking a bit of hard cash out of the bank would provide a reasonable buffer against being without purchasing power should the banks and ATMs go on holiday for a while. This is very easy and doable, 
Our major risk here would be feeling a bit foolish later after nothing happens and we decide to go redeposit that money back in a bank. We might also decide to spread our bets around just in case the bank holiday was not universal and only applied to some banks. Lastly, we might decide to hedge against the vast loss of purchasing power that the people of Argentina experienced while their banks were shuttered. Gold represents one of the few ways to hold a money-like asset entirely outside of the banking system. And we do all of these things before even thinking about starting on the Tier 2 list. And so we proceed to Tier 2, which consists of those items that plug the biggest gaps in your self-assessment and require a significant investment of time, money, and energy. For instance, implementing a savings program so that you can afford needed items or thinking about ways to create a food buffer for your community or getting involved with your neighbors and local scene to a greater extent. All of these items represent Tier 2 actions. After these items have been gone through, it is time to consider the Tier 3 items, the hard stuff. These are the biggest changes or life decisions on your list, such as maybe changing where you live or uh, acquiring new skills, or maybe changing your job. The point is that you should resist the urge to spend any time or energy mulling these over until you've made serious progress on the Tier 1 and Tier 2 actions. If all of this seems like too much work and you are hoping Chapter 20 would be a more directive and simplified, here's what you do shopping list, I can only say that there are no easy answers for the magnitude of the challenges we face. This chapter could easily be an entire course itself, and future videos on my site will explore these topics in greater detail. What I have been consistently trying to prepare people for the whole way along is simply that the next 20 years are going to be unlike the last 20 years. Specifically, I think we each need to be prepared for a financial catastrophe. Not because we're 100% sure it will happen, but because we can't be 100% sure that it won't happen. Prudent adults identify and manage risks. And I think we each need to be prepared for the possibility, the possibility, that a disruption in our basic support systems could ensue. The things that surface in this line of thinking are considered quite out there in today's society, but barely a hundred years ago, our complete dependence on the just-in-time delivery of the basics of life would have been considered mad. Lastly, I think the future is going to be about moving from an I to a we culture. Back to a bygone era where neighbors weren't just nice to each other, but relied on each other. As an informed person, it is now your responsibility to help others as best you can. Perhaps this will be with their knowledge and consent. Perhaps you will have to be more indirect if they are not yet ready to confront these changes. And so I close with a personal call of action to you. Now that you've completed the crash course, I hope you'll agree that the challenges we face are not being adequately addressed at the national or international levels. I created the crash course specifically to reach people one at a time because I hold the belief that some of the risks we are facing are moving much, much faster than the political process. I created the crash course so that you would understand what is going on and do my very best to help you appreciate that the future could be quite different from the past. And I need your help spreading the word. The crash course has been seen by hundreds of thousands of people all across the globe without any advertising on my part. This is because people like you have taken the time to pass it along to their friends, their relatives, and co-workers. But I want it to be seen by millions. We need to create a tipping point of awareness around these issues. And so I need your financial help, too, because I have dedicated four years of my life and much of my bank account towards creating this body of work and then making it freely available to everyone. 
If you have gotten something from this, if it's touched you or even changed your thinking in an important way, then I hope you'll consider paying it forward by making a financial contribution so that somebody else down the line gets to see it too. How much? I would suggest an amount that is neither a stretch for you nor embarrassing. The crash course needs to be seen in the halls of power. I need to train others to deliver the message. I need to travel and take the show to venues both large and small. I need to support the development of multiple language translations. And I need to expand the content, shrink it, add new material, and keep the whole effort moving forward. In whatever way you can contribute to that, even if that's sending the link along to just one other person, I need your help. I will do my part if you do yours. That's my promise to you. Because after all, the future will be defined by what we do. Thank you for listening.